This is Star Talk. Welcome to Star Talk All Stars. I'm Jana Levin, your All Star host for the day. I'm an astrophysicist and author. Joining me as co host is the funny Matt Kirshen, hey. host of Probably Science. Hi, Thank Matt. You, How's it going? Welcome back. Oh, thanks for having me back. <laughs> it's been like 10 minutes. Yeah, it's nice to be here in space. <laughs> it's great to have you. And I also want to introduce one of my favorite people in the world. Joining us in the studio, Ray Weiss. Well, thank you, Jonna. Otherwise known as Rainer Weiss yeah. <laughs> for long. <laughs> great to have you. Ray is Professor Emeritus uh, from MIT. He is also one of the original architects of the LIGO detector, which announced the detection of gravitational waves last year. It was this year. Why does the prompt say last year? Well, it happened last year. <laughs> it happened last year. <laughs> Sorry, guys. This year. <laughs> it was one of the most groundbreaking discoveries of modern astrophysics and very personally important to me. Ray is uh, one of the founders of the LIGO instrument and continues to work on the instrument all the time, as I know, because I've been to the sites with you. <laughs> you kindly let me perform you slog very with modest. Me in the tunnel, I remember. Yes, that. in the heat of Louisiana. It was amazing. So it's so great to have you here. We're going to talk about LIGO and gravitational waves and black holes. So I think what we want to draw out is why this discovery was so important. I think that when people heard about it, it was so the whole world stopped in February 11th when the announcement was made. And for a minute, it was so exciting. Everybody was frozen. And then I felt like an hour later, people just weren't sure what it was all about. <laughs> it's hard to understand. I mean, I, I've got it covered because I'm obviously good on these things. But just for everyone else, if you could just kind of give a vague over. <laughs> well, I'll yeah. try, but I, you know, I, I was as mystified as you <laughs> in the fact that it had this enormous public recognition. Oh, yeah. I mean, you take other Were things. Were you surprised? So I, you made I, the I was more than surprised. I was yeah. flabbergasted, to be honest with you. Oh, really? I mean, I, I mean my, my first real instinct that it had permeated the society was when I came to New York to come and visit you at oh, the, yeah. at, at the uh, Pioneer, Pioneer Works. Works. Yeah. And I get in the subway, and there's this sign that <laughs> says, you know, uh, scientists can find gravitational waves, but they, you can't find an apartment in New York with a old walk-in closet. Right. I said, where in the hell does that come from? <laughs> yeah, you know? exactly. And then, it was a Jeopardy question. <laughs> is yeah. that what it was? Okay. Yeah, no. Also, as well. Oh, I didn't realize that. I didn't yeah. realize that. Yeah. Have you, has science now detected an apartment in New York with a walking closet? <laughs> I haven't been looking lately, but I don't live here. If anyone can find it, Ray can. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ray, do you want to tell us what gravitational waves are? Because this is very hard for people to understand. They can yeah. say the words, but they really don't get what it's all about. And they certainly don't get why you played it to them as a sound. Well, uh, th th let's start with what they might be. I mean, mm. uh, what they are. They're a result of... Uh, Einstein's first thinking about how you measure things in space and time. In other words, he realized back in 1905 that the Newtonian theory we had, the theory that was the theory that was oh, we all learned in high school, was inadequate. Mm -hmm. That you couldn't have things travel so fast that everybody knew about it instantaneously. There had to be some delay because the fastest that things can move, even information, thought. <laughs> is uh, the velocity of light. Right. So if the sun disappeared out. tomorrow, it should take us eight minutes. Well, that's right. If the sun disappears, it. well, yeah, it'll take about eight, nine minutes before mm -hmm. we really know about it. Mm -hmm. and, it's great if you're like a magician or something. <laughs> what, do you need the extra time? Well, yeah, because like David Coffin made the Statue of Liberty disappear, but he had like seconds really to do that in. <laughs> yeah, if you had eight minutes to play with. You could with, do anything. You could, anything. Like, like, you could be an amateur magician. It's still kind of like you'd have time to get some helpers to actually shove it out of place. What'd you do with the sun, Matt? Yeah, but those those eight minutes are damned important right. uh, because they, they tell you that there has to be some mechanism for information to travel not infinitely quickly. Right. So in and Newton's theory, it would that's happen what, That's the first order way of talking about gravitational waves. Mm -hmm. And specifically, what are they? Einstein had a different way of looking at gravity than Newton did. And uh, he taught us all that space and time get distorted by gravity. You get curvatures, you get mm -hmm. distortions of space and time. And what a gravitational wave is, is a traveling distortion of space mm -hmm. and time, but we measure it as a distortion in space. And the very special thing, so you don't have, you can imagine what it is, it's not very hard to imagine, is that it's a stretching of space and a compression of space. And here's, just bear with me, here's what it is. Where the wave travels, let's say, toward you, mm -hmm. and it does its dirty work, perpendicular to the direction in which it's moving. So something's doing this. Mm -hmm. And while it's doing this in okay, one Ray's dimension... oscillating his hands in and out. <laughs> oh, yeah. I got to tell you, that's right. It's like waving a, my hands it's back. Almost like a slinky spring. That's, like. Well, a slinky, let's say a slinky in the X direction, but a slinky inverted in the Y direction. It's doing the opposite. I hope right. you all use right-handed coordinate in, systems. In one dimension, 
in the direction it's moving, perpendicular direction it's moving, it's, it's stretching in one dimension, it's compressing in the other. And that con continual compression, expansion, con travels at the velocity of light toward you. And that's the way to imagine a gravitational Now, world. when you first started thinking about this, yeah. you were a young professor at MIT, and you had this whole gravity research program. And I know you confessed to me <laughs> that they asked you to teach a class in general relativity. <laughs> Well, I'll confess again. <laughs> and, uh, what Janet's referring to is a very big embarrassment. See, I come to MIT having been to Princeton, the hotbed of general relativity and gravity, and I come and I start a group, uh, very expendable. I'm an experimenter. I'm not a theorist like Jana. Jana is a true theorist, but I'm an experimenter. I deal with things with my hands. And, and uh, what, what happened? already, like before the show even started. He was using his hands. Well, wildly. yeah, before the show started, you were kind of looking at the microphone <laughs> and like taking it apart. Like you can't help yourself. <laughs> no, you, know, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got to do that. You got to find out what you're what's, what you're surrounded by. Come on, yeah, that's part right. of the world. Yeah. Palpate, palpate yeah, the world. So you know, it's tactile and it's all sort of seeing things. But anyway, so as Jana says, that what happened is that I'm running this group that is supposedly about very complicated topics like cosmology, which is the history of the universe, and also gravitation. Okay, those were the two things I started. And then the department head comes to me and says, you know, we would like you to teach a course in general relativity, which is a course of the new kind of gravity. And I couldn't tell him I didn't know a damn thing about it. <laughs> I mean, I really didn't know much about it. I didn't know the mathematics. I mean, the students, when I finally started teaching, were probably barely, uh, I was barely half a day ahead of the students, if at all. Right. Okay? So here I go, and I, they ask me a very hard question as we go along. The course has its ups and downs, as you can well imagine. And they asked me a hard question. They said, look, what is a gravitational wave? And I tried to answer it. But what was going on at that time was that Joe Weber, who was a physicist at the University of Maryland, had begun to talk about that he might have discovered gravitational waves. Mm -hmm. okay. And this would have, his campaign about, started in the 50s to No, this was started in the 60s. 60 and, to and, uh, late 60s. Uh, well, he, he started really quite early in 62, mm -hmm. and he made the announcement that he had discovered gravitational waves in 1969. Mm -hmm. That caused a tremendous furor. He was incredibly okay. famous. Right. Uh, well, yeah. And he was lying? He was just... No, 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 no. Don't, don't say lying. That's not the right word. <laughs> We're all very defensive about Joe now. It's like, <laughs> I don't want to brag, but I also did discover gravitational <laughs> waves like about a month before you guys. So, That's good. I'm yeah. glad of that. <laughs> oh, why did yours look like? <laughs> oh, it was just like, it was like, I just put a cup on a, it like kind of wobbled a bit. And the wobbled. water yeah. wobbled and he knew that they were gravitational right. waves. It's like those, <laughs> Jurassic Park. Yeah, well, like those two birds in the New Yorker cartoon. <laughs> yeah. Probably saw that cartoon. I didn't see it. Two, two birds sitting, this is right after the discovery again. Mm -hmm. Two birds sitting on a branch. It was on the 12th of February. We announced on the 11th of February. So, mm -hmm. so somebody had prior information. Right. But these two birds, two birds are looking, one looking at the other and the, for one says, hey, did I hear you, or was that a gravitational wave change? <laughs> and that case already, that's the kind of thing. But anyway, so let me get back to the story. The, uh, the thing was that um, they asked me about this, and I frankly, be honest with you, I, despite having trouble with the mathematics, I also had trouble with understanding Weber's experiment. Mm -hmm. It's not that he was lying or anything like that. It's just a, t a way uh, too complicated for me to understand exactly what he was doing. So I spent a lot of time one night thinking about how could I explain uh, what a gravitational wave does, and how would you detect it in the most pristine, simple-minded way possible? And that's where this haiku, as you call it, yeah. came about, <laughs> which is the, uh, the, I thought, well, you know, one way to do it is send some masses out there, put them out in outer space, put clocks on them, two clocks, one on one, clock on the other, and have a light beam go from one to the other and measure the time. That's all. Yeah. Very straightforward measurement. And they'd have to be sort of floating. so that Floating they, out there. I mean, like bobbing on the wave of the, of, of the ocean if something yeah, Well, they're the actually ocean. just moving along without mm -hmm. any forces on them. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden a gravitational wave comes along and it changes the time that light takes that goes between them. That's it. Mm -hmm. it makes it shorter for a while and longer. It does yeah. exactly what the gravity. You started to build one. Well, right yeah, away. yeah, yeah. But that, that, you know, that's the basic idea. And by the way, that idea mm -hmm. is the one that propagated into the later on LIGO and everything else. Is this mm -hmm. what you wrote about in your book? Is this what? Over yeah, mentioned. yeah. So um, I was fascinated with you mentioned Ray looking at the microphones and all this stuff. I was fascinated that Ray said that he started life with one ambition, which was to make music easier to hear. That's right. And yeah. then you dreamt up, which is basically a cosmic recording device, a <laughs> sort of insane, gigantic. Gigantic cosmic recording device to record sounds from space. She was the only one in my whole life who ever made that analogy, and she was right. You know, I mean, she, oh, I told yes. her the story. Awesome. And you, you, because I think you have a musical background, or around you is music, and yeah. understood this right away. Yeah. 
But it's absolutely true. It was. It, yeah. So what's the book called? Um, Black Hole Blues and Other Songs from Outer Space, <laughs> which awesome. if I was Neil deGrasse Tyson, I would say in an awesome, deep DJ voice. <laughs> I think I do have him recorded saying it. I, I should air it. You just play that in at that yeah, point. Right, kind of exactly. Just write, edit that in. But so you, this is, okay, early 70s now we're talking about. Yeah, right. Okay, so it's 50 60s, years ago. 70s, yeah. And you started to build the first... Um, uh, machine, but it was really quite small. Yeah. And as I remember, you got a lot of flack for it because nobody thought you were going to succeed. They well, thought you were wasting your time. Well, it was worse than that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is sort of an interesting epic in the whole history of the field. Yes, it, I got some money from the military, by the way, mm -hmm. who was funding my research. At the one time, military support was very, very good. You know, it was not, had, no, had no onus associated with it in mm -hmm. the society. And uh, what happened was that they supported this, and what happened, I got a, about $50,000 to build a small prototype. Mm -hmm. And then, all of a sudden, everybody got very disenchanted with the military when the Vietnam War happened. Mm -hmm. And the funding for this Here goes stopped. your funding. The funding stopped because the military was only supposed to support those things that were relevant to its mission. And gravitational waves weren't quite in the military's <laughs> complement of things they had to worry about. Right. So, so and uh, how that, can we use gravitational waves to kill our enemy? Like, how can we? <laughs> well, I'll t if it gets there, I'll tell you later. We'll do that in segment to, three. We'll if do you that. care to pursue it, right. if you want to pursue this, I'll tell you later. Or at least just to like upset someone. Like, how can I use it to upset a neighbor? Like, my neighbor's playing music too loud. Right. Like, I'm gonna send gravitational waves <laughs> towards them, yeah. full blast. Well, <laughs> you're now the master of gravity, right? That's what we're dealing with here. Well, we're gonna come yeah. back. We're gonna come back to this discussion yeah. and. And, but before then, I think it's time for us to take some cosmic queries. So if you are out there in the ether, All right. send us your messages. It's too late now, of course. It is too late. Well, <laughs> is it? I don't know. It depends if we can time, time travel. Look? Can gravitational waves help us time travel? Well, you know what? Might as well ask this question then. This is perfect <laughs> unintentional timing here. But Jake the Guy on Instagram uh, is asking, uh, does any of this mean I can travel in time? <laughs> Wow. Ray, do in gravitational time. waves help us travel in time? I don't know how they would, but maybe you have an idea. You're a theorist. Though. I don't think so. I don't think so. I can't think of a way in which they would help us travel in time. But, you know, you can always travel to the future. I mean, always. If you That's set a things up, out, though. Like, you can we're doing it right now. I can travel towards your future, though. That's pretty weird. I could travel to a time when you are 15 years older and I'm only like a couple months older. Okay, by going off to space and coming back. Yeah, I can, you know, send you far from the Earth, or I can go to a black hole or something like that. So I can always travel to somebody else's future. But traveling to the past is the hard part. That's pretty tricky. Um, all right, Taylor from Eugene, we Oregon. Did, we did a fairly lousy job of answering him. You know, it, did, it was a good enough. Yeah. Well, a I think, I'm pretty I think sure like, Ray yeah, just you, said I gave a lousy answer. Oh, no, you did give a lousy answer. <laughs> and there's answer. only one person in the world I would take that from. <laughs> probably want something very deep. I mean, it was, it was it deep. Was you just enough. weren't paying enough attention. Enough. Yeah, I, 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 <laughs> so Taylor from Eugene, Oregon is, uh, asks, uh, do gravitational waves have any direct effect on the physical environment? For example, if an event causing gravitational waves occurred close enough to Earth, would it have any discernible effect on humans or the planet? Well, that's a question I can even answer. And in fact, if we, we, we measured this event from two black holes, and I have to start that way, which was, fortunately for us, 1.2 billion light years away. But had we been, let's say, within a few tens of years of that, uh -huh. we would have measured something. And you would have measured exactly what we measure in our detectors. You wouldn't stretched in one dimension mm -hmm. and then compressed in the other dimension. You would have felt that. Now, we resist yeah. uh, stretching and compression, but our you know, auditory mechanism is designed to resonate in response. Do you think that we could technically hear a gravitational wave even in the no, absence of I air? I don't think that's, that's not because I've it's... I've been saying this for months. Well, I don't think it's true, <laughs> Well, I think let me let's get to that yeah. privacy issue right away because we've we and not you mm -hmm. we have generated some confusion mm -hmm. by saying this is <laughs> listening to the universe, which is what a lot of people have said about this, yeah. and it's true, but it's nothing. It's not necessarily a sound wave that's exciting us. You see, and what what is happening is that we are seeing these stretchings and compressions, and that's certainly going on in your ear too. Mm -hmm. but the compression and extension, even for that one mile, one, one year away, light year away, mm -hmm. is still too small for your right. ear. So how I close think. do you think? Oh yeah, I would uh, agree you, with if that. If you got close enough, you would, but if you got close it, enough. you would feel it over your whole body, mm -hmm. and you might hear something, but mm -hmm. that's not what we're doing. What we're so doing, like a sound wave is like the compression and expansion of the air around you, that's and right. this is 
the actual it, space itself is doing that. Yeah, but, but be careful. What it is is space, you're right, space is doing the expansion and the compression. On the other hand, our instruments, this is where it gets converted into sound. That's why I looked at your microphone. <laughs> is uh, that What we do is we have a device that measures these very tiny displacements. We're using light and the timing of light. But then we convert that into a sound by amplifying it. And then that gets put into a loudspeaker, yes, and then it makes a sound. Mm -hmm. Look, the important- It's a lot like an electric guitar. Exactly, but exactly like an electric guitar. Yeah. You've got a very good analogy. Yeah. <laughs> very good analogy. And, and the other thing is that it's an, the, other, the other piece of it is that this phenomena, these phenomena we're seeing, a phenomena we're seeing, are things that have the frequency of our, auto, of our auditory system. That's the nature is making things with frequencies that run from the bottom of the piano to the top of the piano. And that's just by chance. That just well, that's because be the things that. we're looking at, well, it's a little more than that. What it is is our instrument's only sensitive in that band, okay? okay? And on top of that, nature is kind enough to give us something that does its wiggling and expanding and contracting and accelerating in that frequency band. A couple of black holes collide. They that's happen right. to ring space-time in the human auditory frequency. Exactly. So let's... Well, yeah, okay, so it's not sound waves traveling through, no. through space. I just don't want to have that... It's like an electric guitar string. It's exactly. not a sound that's wave a traveling through space. That's a wonderful analogy for people. But you had to build LIGO to build the body of the guitar. That's the guitar. To record the shape. Absolutely. Of the, of the wave. That's a beautiful analogy. <laughs> Excellent. And then we're going to all break out into <laughs> air-style guitar. <laughs> Give us another cosmic query. From Florida, uh, Sarah Garvey Jan is asking, uh, when gravitational waves are recorded, is there a way to know which black holes collided to make them? And is there any other event out there that could cause gravitational waves? If so, how would they differ? Boy, that's a profound question. And this has a lot of different pieces to that question. Uh, let's first of, all, first of all say, how do we know that we are even seeing black holes? Is that, I think that's one way in our experiment that we were seeing black holes. You have to do an analysis to find that out. It could be other systems that you know, neutron stars, there are many, many things that oscillate and wiggle that can make gravitational waves. But it happens to be, and this is the important thing, the specific wiggles we saw, when you solve them as trying to figure out what the motions are that made those wiggles, you wind up with masses that are, in our case, the first one was too big. The masses are 30, each one of the masses was about 30 solar masses. And we don't know of things. We know of, we, we know of ordinary stars that do that, but they're too, too big. Because what happens if you take an ordinary star, that might be It was surprising how big they were. They, they what? It was surprising how big they were. Yeah, but monstrous. It's exciting. Yeah, yeah, monstrous. I mean, all the black holes people had seen, or read, not, they, nobody's seen a black hole, but had evidence for, was around 10 solar and smaller around there. No, the important thing is that once you make the calculation that you know it's about 30 solar masses that are jiggling around, you then say, my God, look how close they are. But from the equations, you can say, they're much closer than any star. They're, they would be inside of each other. Yeah, they're a couple hundred kilometers That's across. Right. These things are no bigger than the, just the size of Connecticut, maybe, mm -hmm. yeah. or, you know, and or even smaller. Maybe so the only uh, things that big that can also be that close are black holes. Well, that's that's the argument. That's fundamentally that's the, the best argument. we can do. Exactly the argument. So maybe there's something else that we, when we got close, we would realize didn't have an event horizon, yeah. wasn't a complete shadow, wasn't really empty space time. That you know, it could be different than what we think of a black hole as, but it's got to be heavy and small. Yeah. Um, so I think that's an interesting place to end, and I'm really sorry we have to wrap this up, but I'm glad we're going to come back in a minute. <laughs> we're going to take a short break, stick around for more discussion and more of your cosmic queries after this. We're back on Star Talk All Stars. I'm your host, Jan Levin. I am an astrophysicist and author here in New York City at Barnard College of Columbia University. Here with me is my incredibly talented co host, Matt Kirshen. Yay! Hey. <laughs> Matt, comedian and host of Probably Science podcast which is very funny. Thank it you. It is a long rambling, they have no rules, and that's what we love about them. <laughs> I started saying funny, and then you went long and rambling. They were like, your next, oh, it's dreary, um, it's a dirt, they uh, have no point. They're going to cut that part out, Matt. <laughs> Our special science guest today is uh, Ray Weiss, professor emeritus from MIT, and one of the founders of LIGO, architect of the original instrument that recently detected gravitational waves. I remember when uh, you we're talking about in the last segment um, running out of funding because the military funding was cut. And um, you told me the next big event is I Met Kip. Well, I loved that line. Let me tell you what the next event was. Okay. The next event was really trying to get money. That was the next event to try to finish it. And that's what happened. Kip comes soon. Mm -hmm. But the next event was really trying to get some money. And that's where I ran into the trouble. Mm -hmm. You said there were trouble getting that money, getting yeah. that. To people were skeptical. And, and people, your instrument was a meter and a half. Across. Yeah, the, in, the initial prototype, 
it was a meter and a half. If we wanted to just demonstrate, it was never intended to make a detection. Mm -hmm. In fact, nothing until LIGO was even ever able to contemplate making a detection. Didn't somebody tell you I could do better by looking out the window? If the well, sun blew up, you couldn't detect it? <laughs> yeah. Well, one of my graduate students, the first time I ever put a graduate student on the project, had a terrible time with, his, with, with my colleagues because mm -hmm. they had no measurement of a real scientific result. They had a beautiful piece of technology, but that's not what you get a PhD for in physics necessarily. Uh, but let's get away from that because mm -hmm. you asked the question. So what happened is they, the, um, I tried to get money and I didn't. And they, what, the, what happened is the, is the National Science Foundation, which is what they do always, sends proposals to everybody mm -hmm. who knows something about this. And what they did is they sent it to Europe. Mm -hmm. And the Europeans don't have quite the same mores mm -hmm. about an American proposal. And I had a very interesting conversation with a guy from the Max Planck Institute. Now this is after your grant was declined. Yes. Well, yeah, the, that's right. <laughs> yeah, 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 it was declined. So here you are with no money. Yeah, yeah. Here <laughs> I, in 1975 or so, yeah. we had started building the thing in 72. Yeah. And uh, I was trying to finish it. And uh, so we got this wonderful call from a guy at the Max Planck, and he says, you know, we've been working on Weber bars. We didn't see anything. We, and by the way, they had done a beautiful job of not mm -hmm. seeing anything. Right. You know, sometimes not seeing something is better than seeing something, especially if in it's the not case, there. In that case, right. yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> All I can be talking about my dancing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, it's better to not see. It's better so, to not see. Every scientist will tell you that. Yeah. So because you make confusion if you see something that's there, and that's right. not supposed to be there. And so, uh, and there are a lot of things there that are not supposed to be there. Yeah, yeah. And so what happened is, <laughs> very good. So what they, they did is they asked me if they, if they would mind if they would work on this. They thought it was a good idea. I said, how can you mind? Mm -hmm. And they asked me if I had a graduate student I could send them or somebody that had been right. working on this. But here they are. They're, they're kind of pulling ahead on well, your they idea. Got, they pulled way ahead. They pulled ahead on your idea. They had funding. They, they had, had funding capacity. and they were very good. Besides, yeah. give them credit. Yeah. They were superb. Right. And, as, and that a also started a, my colleague, uh, the Ron Drever in, 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 in Scotland, mm -hmm. who also was doing Weber bars of a different kind, and then he got interested in this. Mm -hmm. And both of those groups, I just have to say it and make sure people hear it, mm -hmm. they both yeah. did a spectacular job of making the thing better, the idea better, and getting mm -hmm. the thing working. Now, eventually... So that's after that is when I met Kip. Right. So eventually it becomes you, Kip, and this is now fast-forwarding 10 years, you, Kip, and Ron Drever become the, the three, the troika, right. that initiate the development of LIGO. It even right. gets a name. It finally gets a name. In like 1985. It didn't have the name before. Laser Interferometer I mean, Gravitational Wave Observatory. So LIGO started 30 years ago. It started, well, 50. LIGO started really, now it's a little mm -hmm. earlier than that, in 83. Okay. Because what happened is we did a study. This is that, that KIP getting to KIP mm -hmm. it has a little pre prelude to it yet. Mm -hmm. if we, I couldn't get the money for the prototype. Eventually I got some money. But I decided by looking at the wonderful work that had been done in Europe that I was not going to be in such a hurry to finish the prototype, but rather I would rather do a study to find out what it really would take to build a LIGO. Right. So here you had a 1.5 meter machine, and how big did you decide it had to be? It had to be, well, we started studying, and I did a whole study of it. It looked like it had to be over a kilometer. Right. And I, I wanted to do 10. A thousand fold. Yeah, well, I wanted to do 10. <laughs> like something that was about, like, yay big. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Arm span to it doesn't fit on the MIT campus or even in Cambridge, Massachusetts right. anymore. Right. <laughs> most of my experiments like the size of a matchbox. Right. They well, involve... Well, nowadays, they even get smaller, you know, these nanotechnology things. But you can't do gravitational wave for that way. Why? You can't do it because the amount of motion is bigger, the amount of motion the gravitational wave induces is proportional to the size of the system. That, see, what's constant in a gravitational wave is the strain. That's getting a little technical. Mm -hmm. but that's the ratio of the added displacement, the compression or expansion of the gravity wave, divided by the distance that the objects are already apart. And that, that number, that ratio is a constant. Yeah, it's very small. So LIGO now is, has these mirrors suspended at the corners of this L-shaped, four kilometer long, two right. instruments on two different coasts, one in Louisiana, one in Hanford. By how much are the mirrors displaced? Well, You're describing that I, that's I, the same. Do you mind so if I use kilometers? exponential notation? I have to. I, I can translate. You can translate. Well, it's 10 to the minus 18 meters. So uh, it's about which is a million trillion. Okay. You like that? Fine. <laughs> a millionth of a trillionth yeah. of the size of the arm. Of so the over arm. four kilometers, yeah. it's very small, yeah. which is how it, it, it's like... Well, no, uh, no, it's 10 to the minus 21 is the strain, mm -hmm. and it's 10 to the minus 18 is the amount of motion in a four kilometer arm. Uh, right. So that comes to about a 10,000th of the width of a proton. Exactly. Yeah. That's and exactly You right. had to convince who to let you build this? <laughs> well, a lot of people. And that was the thing you see. When you tell, you tell somebody you're going to measure, tell an engineer 
I mean, a solid, well-rounded engineer that you're going to measure something at 10 to minus 21, which is really the right number to use because that's what the gravitational field strength is. They look at you like you were sort of a madman. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I mean, ten, nothing gets measured at that 10 to minus 21. So that's the first problem you have. The second problem you have is you got a nut like me <laughs> trying to convince some heavy that, you know, you can do this. Right. Now, why should they trust me? You know, that's the other problem. I have no recommendation for well, that. Well, plus, people yeah. weren't even sure there were black holes out and there for a large part of your initiative. And, you, and what Jana just hit is the fundamental problem, that really the fundamental problem that we had, which was nobody could tell us how much, how, what were the sources. So now we have three, a triple go. That's really bad. A triple no. Let's mm -hmm. put it that way. An, an insanely small number. Mm -hmm. A guy who's a little bit of a flake, okay, mm -hmm. to driving it. And, uh, <laughs> that would be you? <laughs> yes, I'm afraid so. <laughs> and, and then nobody can attest that there's real sources. So, and people at MIT, where I, was a, where I was a faculty, saying black holes didn't exist. Mm -hmm. See, that was a whole a backdrop of this as so well. So what possessed so you to, you to keep them going? them to spend money to detect the effects of something that they don't think exists. That's right. And, and it's a lot of money, 100 million bucks about. Well, Ray, you didn't know that they existed either. I mean, you didn't not. know. So what possessed you to keep going? I mean, it is insane. Well, I, I, I'm going to give you insane. a very Good silly, <laughs> silly answer, which is the truth. Okay. Uh, a really silly answer. Mm -hmm. You think I'm a really mm -hmm. profound scientist. That's baloney. <laughs> but I enjoyed the work. Mm -hmm. And I enjoyed the people. Mm -hmm. And that was what drove it. Mm -hmm. I hate to tell you that. Mm -hmm. It was interesting work to do. I think that's a great thing for people to understand. Yeah, yeah. Scientists do what they do because they love it, not necessarily out of ego right. satisfaction. Yeah, no, the so end result I... was, was, it was an interesting result. Could we get such a result? It was a good gamble to take. Yeah. But that wasn't the thing that drove me. I have to tell you that. Yeah. It is something that I get because like, when I'm doing my experiments on the effects of paint drinking on blindness, <laughs> uh, like it's, not, it's not the glory. I'm not going for the glory. It's actually it's just about the work and it's fun. I enjoy and it. You fully expect, though, that there will be glory at the end of yeah, the day. Yeah, I expect that there might. There's a bit of me in the back of the mind that's like, yeah, it is going to cause you're gonna, and I'm You're going to be the name of a paint color. I will be able to write it up. But at the time, you just do it. You just drink that paint and you write down your results as best you're able to write. Yeah, so now well, we get to Kip because, see, Kip was a different kind of person. Right. Kip was a theorist, okay? And he had spent a lot of his life thinking about what might be the sources of gravitational waves. And in fact, he started writing some very elegant stuff already in the 70s, early 70s, about if there were a way to measure gravitational waves, what would be interesting to detect? Mm -hmm. And he started inventing a lot of very interesting So ideas. Kip really pushed the science case. And, and you know, he was so cool-headed. He was just totally unflappable in the sense that even when other people were saying, we won't detect black holes, we won't detect black holes until 2020, some people told me. Yeah, as that, recently as August, right? Yeah. And Kip was like, nope, black holes first. Black holes are going to be first. So he, he really pushed that scientific case. Well, and he, had a, and he had good reason because, you see, he had developed a very, probably one of the most prestigious groups in the country for the theoretical parts of gravitation. He had, uh, he, it's interesting, Kip and I, we didn't know it. Well, Kip tells me he thinks he remembers, but I don't. We were both at Princeton together at the same time. I was a postdoc. He was a grad student. And by the way, Joe Weber was there also exactly uh -huh. the same time. With John Wheeler. With John Wheeler, the, exactly. The American uh, granddaddy of yep, American right. relativists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So Kip, was the reason I think that what's so important for Kip to be part of it is he gave it a, a certain cachet. I mean, that the fact is he showed people that it was possible mm -hmm. that you could have sources besides the one that anybody, all, everybody knew about. Supernova. Which was supernova, yeah. mm -hmm. So when a star explodes, yeah. it can wobble space-time, right. which we now think is probably the hardest thing to it's go a for. Yeah, yeah. It's a very hard so, source. To so uh, let's, uh, before we get to the discussion of the actual discovery, let's take some cosmic queries. All right. So uh, Gabriel Thielen, on, uh, who's a Patreon patron, says... What kind of patron? Patreon. It's a website that lets people give They're money. They're supporters I don't know what of the fabulous is. show. Financial supporter of the show. Uh, and Gabriel asks, theoretically, is there anything stopping gravitational waves from traveling faster than the speed of light? Is uh, uh, It is the same phenomenon, is it not, as a theoretically a theoretical localized artificial space-time distortion or warp? Thank you very much. Um, can I try this one and then, oh, yeah, Ray, you it. jump in? So just like there are light waves electromagnetic waves, which is radiation, there is a particle complement to that, and that is a massless particle, and 
it travels at the speed of light. We think that that's exactly analogous to what's happening with gravitational waves, that there's a wave in the uh, gravitational um, field and that there is a particle called the graviton, which is massless in Einstein's theory. That might be wrong, but in Einstein's theory, it's massless. And in that case, like all massless things, it travels at the speed of light. Um, no faster, no slower, but that could be wrong. It's very hard to test the speed of light um, by looking at gravitational waves. I'm sorry, the speed of the gravitational waves. It's very hard to test, isn't it? Well, we try to make an attempt. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, do you want to hear about that? It's yeah. Just, uh, very, I mean, if we ever get, I mean, there's a future and there's a current. I'll give you the future because it's easier to understand. Now that we are in the business finally of detecting things, people will try to look for not just bursts of gravitational waves, but rather ones that are very steady radiators, like you know, an antenna on a transmitter blowing its waves out into mm -hmm. space. Like a neutron star with a bump on a it. Neutron, that's right. like a Perfect. paddle. A neutron star with a bump on it that's rotating, and so it gives a nice continuous wave. Like a monotone. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's slowly decaying, but that's, it's a monotone. You're absolutely right. <laughs> Over our time scale. <laughs> <laughs> and then what happens is a very interesting thing. You can do a very simple thing that you, even I can imagine. Mm -hmm. You can look at that source as we move around in, the, in our orbit in the solar system, and you will get added time each time, that, you know, this store, source will be someplace in the orbit, outside of our orbit, mm -hmm. and we go around and it takes different lengths of time for the mm -hmm. signal to get to us. And since we know our velocity, we can get the velocity of light because we increase the distance to the, to the object. Mm -hmm. We know how much we increased it by. So it's a very straightforward kinematic measurement. On the other hand, the, uh, we already have sort of a quasi-measurement the of the velocity of the gravitational waves from a simple thing. We saw, I, mean, I have to explain, as, as mm -hmm. Jenna said, we have two of these detectors, mm -hmm. one in Louisiana, mm -hmm. and another one in Washington state. And we saw the signal first mm -hmm. in Louisiana. And seven milliseconds later, we saw it in, in, in Hanford, Washington. Mm -hmm. Well, that already tells you it's moving pretty damn close to the velocity of light. Yeah, as it crosses the continent. As it crosses the continent. That's a pretty good way of... It, it's pretty yeah. great. Yeah. It, it's a, I love that they're the seven milliseconds are just clocked. Okay. It's, yep. it's fantastic. So Nathan Kruger on Facebook says, are there currently any plans to conduct the double slit experiment using gravity waves? <laughs> oh, that's an interesting question. <laughs> it's so... Gravity is so weak, it's so hard to manipulate. Um, Ray, what do you think? You're well, I'll the, tell you what the real problem is. Uh, there are two problems. Mm -hmm. One of them is you can't make us, we, you would have to make an artificial source to do that. Mm -hmm. And when you start doing that, you'll find out that you just don't have the power. You, don't, can, you can't accelerate enough mass and move it fast enough so that you can even detect the waves. Yeah. And Einstein said this in his very first paper on gravitational waves in 1916. He writes a lovely sentence at the end of the paper saying, look, if we can post points to all the calculations, he says, no, it's very unlikely. In fact, he doesn't even say unlikely, it's impossible that these waves will have any physical consequence that we can measure because of that, that he tried to look at things like st stars that what he knew about or locomotives smashing into each other. Well, I'm making that up because I don't know what he really thought about. <laughs> I mean, that piece of paper that says that's where he did his calculation. Yeah, he didn't believe this. black holes were real. So yeah, Well, the other thing is black holes were even, not even yeah. considered at that moment. Yeah. But just the calculation where he came so pessimistic about this, that I'd, I'd like to have to see a piece of paper that has that. Mm -hmm. He must have done it. So the so, fact that uh, Einstein didn't so, think black holes are real and I do makes me <laughs> smarter than Einstein? Like, what are we doing? <laughs> oh, you know, just a little later, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> if you time traveled to before Einstein and believed in black holes, that would make you oh pretty boy, smart. Oh boy, Jenna's right on that point. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have one last? We've got a minute for our last well, cosmic we'll theory, really question. quick. I didn't answer the question, but never oh, mind. sorry, I know. I don't know. You need to make an artificial source to make an interference pattern. And right. And that's why I was, I just don't think we can do it. Unless, yeah. So Mary uh, not gonna tell ya. I don't think that's her real name. I'm almost guaranteeing that it's not. Uh, says, I asked this before as a silly question, but I've been thinking about it. Maybe it's not so silly. If gravitational waves were represented by colors, what would they be and why or how? Hmm. That's pretty well, easy. yeah, I mean, the frequency of the sound can be translated directly to the frequency of light, which is a specific color. That's right. So right. That's what almost. colors would they be? They'd be, they'd be, uh, well, these would well be outside of the eye. Completely yeah. out of the eye. Your eye would have to be like the size of uh, a huge radio. Day. I don't know, a very big thing. Um, oh, I'm sorry to shorten that question, but we have to wrap this part up, this segment. Uh, stick around for more discussion, and we're going to discuss the actual discovery of the first black hole collisions and also the lightning round of your cosmic queries. <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> 
We are back on Star Talk All Stars. I'm your All Star host today, Jan Eleven. In the studio with me, we have my comedian co host, Matt Kirshen. Hey, Jana. And our science guest, Ray Weiss, Hi. to Hi, talk Jana. more about the LIGO discovery. Good to see you again, 10 seconds later. <laughs> <laughs> now, a lot of people are talking about the discovery, so let's give people a sense of what actually happened. Okay. It was about, what, 1.3 billion years ago? Uh, two black holes collided. Now, those black holes might have lived together a long time. What about the gravitational waves when they were far apart, when they first formed black holes, when the stars died? What about those gravitational waves? You had an instrument up in 2000. Yeah. Well, let's let's be honest about why we didn't see it in the year mm. 2000. That's what you're complaining about, right? <laughs> well, <wasn't really laughs> I think a complaint. you are. Uh, we <laughs> didn't have those an, gravitational waves have been coming across us since multi-celled yeah. organisms were fossilizing yeah, on the let's, Earth. Let's start with what mu must have been the case with these. Mm. Is and I think this is probably going to hold, even though there are other ideas now mm -hmm. about this. But uh, we, as you say, we saw the thing that happened about 1.2, 1.3 billion years ago, mm -hmm. and we saw it at its end point, at the very end when the two, two black holes were getting closer and closer, they go orbiting around each other, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden they hit each other and they make a new black hole. That's mm -hmm. what they do. There's when you do, they swallow each other as their event horizons come, come, come together, and you wound up with, let's say there were two 30 solar mass stars to begin with, and you wind up with a 57 solar mass black hole mm -hmm. when they make a new one. Mm -hmm. So the first thing you have to explain is where did that three solar mass They lost go? some mass. Well, they yeah. went someplace. So right. Well, they went into gravitational waves. Mm -hmm. and, well, that's unbelievable when you think about it. Right. So it's completely dark. None of it comes out as nothing light. Nothing comes if out I in light. If a telescope at these two black holes colliding, I would see nothing. You'd see nothing. Complete and that's darkness. one of the tragedies because you'd love to be able to see something mm -hmm. so you could identify where it is. Right. We don't have the faintest idea where it is in the sky, except for the fact that it hit Louisiana first. Mm -hmm, from the southern and, and sky. From the southern sky and went up. So we have sort of a banana in the sky <laughs> where we think this thing comes from. Mm -hmm. But to, we were sort of a thousand square degrees of ignorance is what right. we have. So now there's a black hole out there and it's gone quiet and we can't look at it either. Nope, it's gone. <laughs> and you don't, know where to, you, you don't know where to tell people to go look for it. Right. So that's sort of something we want to fix. Mm -hmm. But we'll get to how we fix that in a minute. Mm -hmm. but let, let, let's get back to what happened before we saw them, okay? And there, it's a tricky one. It depends how they got made. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how did you those see? black holes and that's, form? Uh, the if first they place. got, and we don't know how it got made, and that's going to be one of the more interesting scientific questions. As we, when we go back on the air and begin to see a lot of these things, we can begin to contemplate. But there are two ideas that people had right away. One thing is a star collapses. That's called common envelope, and they mm -hmm. come together and they two, make two black holes. Mm -hmm. By the way, Hans Peter explained to me many years ago, just like mm -hmm. Kip, that mm -hmm. that's the first thing we would see. Oh, okay, uh -huh. that was back in the 1990. Oh. By the way, he's yeah. still alive. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that's one thing. That's one method and that could be. Mm -hmm. Requires a star that's pretty heavy. 60 solar, 70, 80 that's solar mass. Yeah, big star. Yeah, big star. <laughs> big mammoth star. Yeah. So where did that come from? Okay, that's a question. But then the other possibility, which is not quite as dramatic, is that we have things which are called globular clusters. What are those? Those are regions in our galaxy and every galaxy has places where a lot of star formation forms simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And so here are a bunch of stars all zipping around, and there's a lot of probability that maybe three of them will get together, bang into each other, and oh, I thought it has to be orchestrated properly, okay? Mm -hmm. And so they make a thing that's a black hole, or maybe they have to make two black holes. Mm -hmm. Because, now, why can't it just be a big star that died and made a black hole? Well, it's too heavy. It's well, it's it, well, yeah. Be careful, Jenna. It could be that, and people are thinking that. <laughs> and some people even let me now go on. These are the decay into a very technical conversation. <laughs> this gets into something really quite tricky. But let me say that's what about what, the metallicity of this. Ah, no, 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 no. Come on, let's get away from that. But the, uh, the that was important. about to be my question. <laughs> I mean, your question. You were going to ask that, right? Yeah, I, I was going to ask yeah, that. Well, yeah, yeah, okay. Well, the hell with the metallicity yeah. for a moment. So, so we only see the final fraction of a second. How much of that collision do you actually detect? Uh, did LIGO detect? LIGO detected only about 0.2, point by, well, let's say a quarter of a second of this a whole thing. A quarter of a second. So <laughs> it was emitting the gravitational waves. It just didn't get loud enough until that final and, Well, to be careful. Second. It's two reasons. Yes, mm -hmm. you're right. But the real reason we didn't catch it is because our detector can't detect anything with very low frequencies. As I told you, mm -hmm. it goes from the bottom of the piano to the top mm -hmm. of the piano. So this is a rumble. Once they're very far apart, those stars, if they have been stars, if they started far apart, mm -hmm. they might not have. Mm -hmm. We don't know that. Mm -hmm. Suppose, like every other thing, they started far apart. Then they would be going very slowly around each other. Mm -hmm. Hours, periods of right. hours. And that would be low frequencies. That'd be very, well we don't have any detection. sensitivity, but something yeah. later in the, in the history of man will have that sensitivity. Mm -hmm. It's called LISA. That's the space version of LIGO. Okay? I love your optimism. Uh, well, it's going to happen. <laughs> Maybe not mine, but in your lifetime. I'm building my own LIGO at home. 
<laughs> like, what kind of scale should I aim for? Do you know that actually happened to me? I went to the LIGO lab. I am not actually an experimentalist in the collaboration, so I haven't signed the Memorandum of Understanding, and there are certain things I'm not allowed to know. But I was looking at the schematic of the lab, and I was like, why am I allowed to see this? And somebody said, what, are you going to go home and build one? <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, you got yeah, a couple. I am. Just you watch me, <laughs> yeah. and then everyone's going to be really embarrassed when you've done one for like. Dollars. Well, I'll tell you, if you come up with a clever idea that doesn't need something so big, and people at one time thought maybe optical fibers, I won't go into it all. Mm -hmm. None of these ideas have worked out, but people are all the time thinking about how could they make a small version of something like this that is as sensitive. Mm -hmm. But let me go back. The 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 so what you have is these big things that they're very. Let's suppose they got started mm -hmm. separately. And they come, they, they, they are still bound to each other, and they yeah. eventually oscillate, and they get closer and closer, and they're losing energy to gravitational waves, which we're not detecting mm -hmm. because it's outside of our band. Mm -hmm. and then we detect it just as it comes into our band. I see. So just that's the most likely in. explanation, but there are others, right. too. Right. You know? Now, um, you were really hoping for the centenary for the first detection. So here you've been building this thing for 50 years, Ray. I can't tell you how many times somebody said to me, we better go ask Ray. You know, on site, you're doing experiments, you're, you're walking the beam tubes, and you want it to be 2015. You wanted that so badly, I know. And 16 or 15 was good, 16 was the latest. Okay, so you were willing to take 16, and then if not that, you would find an Einstein paper that was, you know. It's a 2018 right. paper, but that was it. <laughs> no, a lot of people told me 2018, don't expect a detection before 2018. Yeah. But on September 14th, 2015, yep. this struck. You, it must have blown your mind. I mean, what is so the they, experience of waking up that morning and checking the logs yeah. and well, seeing? I was thinking it was like it was the practice run that like that wasn't meant to be the run that detected anything, right? You're absolutely on the mark. That's correct. Yeah, it's even worse than that. What, what happened is we we didn't expect this, and when, as Jana points out, I happened to be on vacation. I had been at the site the, the days before that. And I almost screwed it up. <laughs> uh, you know that story. I yeah. Think. But I do tell want to us. tell you the story yeah. because I, I was sent by, by my boss, uh, Peter Fritchell, who is the young student that I had and now is a senior member of this thing. He says, Weiss, you've got to go down there, fix the RF interference. That's a, you know, radio frequency. Radio, radio frequency interference. <laughs> and because it will disturb the whole run. So I went down there and I saw what was really a big mess. I mean, FCC, you know, the Federal C C C Communications Commission would have sent their truck there and shut us off <laughs> because we put out so much RF. And then I found out the problem was, and I said to Peter, look, uh, this is going to take a week to fix up. I, I can't, I don't. Mm -hmm. and they had a big conference, and the reason why they told me no was that they had committed themselves to making a run two days later. Hmm. I was just there. left it like it was. It was a run, and you had to, and he said, look, we have all these people coming from all over the country, all over the world, mm -hmm. coming to the sites. We don't want to jeopardize this. And you're, the RF, if it's a problem, well, it can't kill us. And I said, no, it won't kill us for an impulsive source. But if you're looking for periodic sources, it might. Mm -hmm. And so we took that gamble. And Peter said, let's come home. Okay? Yeah. And uh, thank God. <laughs> 24 I went hours later. Yeah, it's, well, it's what, about three, two <laughs> days later. It was a, two, uh, three, it was a Thursday. The thing happened on a... It, yeah, it, it was, happened on a Monday. It happened on Monday. So it was four days later. Okay. So you what checked... Yeah. What's... And so uh, you asked, what did I think? Yeah, you well, check I, the log. You wake up 8 a.m. in Well, May. I'll tell you what happened. That was really cute. <laughs> I went to, went to the log. We were on vacation. My wife mm -hmm. and son were with me and, and, her, and, and, her, his, and his, his wife. And I was looking at the log, which I do every morning. Mm -hmm. And I see this thing, which was very cryptic. It says, we're canceling a fix-it day. Now, we have fix-it day every Tuesday. <laughs> you know, we are running in the middle of a run, even in an engineering one. We, when we find all these things wrong, we don't want to mess with the apparatus, but we do it at a certain time so both sites are dead at the same time. And they said, no, we're canceling it. So I look at the other side, same damn thing. Mm -hmm. uh, we're canceling Fix-It Day. So I call up, what's the hell, what's going on? And they say, well, and then I, it didn't take long, I began to get email. Mm -hmm. And then very quickly, within about half an hour after that, I saw an absolutely magnificent curve, mm -hmm. which was this, this signal, which now is on people's dresses, it's, yeah. it's in everywhere, and it was this, this, this binary black hole, 30 solar masses. Mm -hmm. And I look at it, it's holy mackerel, this has mm -hmm. got to be a fake. Mm -hmm. Really mackerel that you said? Yes. <laughs> well, maybe not. I'm trying to be careful. <laughs> he's, yeah, he's cleaning it up for air. <laughs> if I know you, Ray, that's holy not what you smokes. said. Holy smokes, whiz. <laughs> no, none of those. You're a 1920s paper boy. <laughs> Say, mister, mister. <laughs> To scoops. <laughs> it was really something when in February, all these months later, the announcement was made and everybody just shared in this incredible excitement. That was really a moment in history. And it was, well, we did a lot of work between the time we, we found it 
And then yeah. because we didn't believe it. Yeah. Let's be honest. I mean, yeah. Jana, that was such a big signal. We mm-hmm. never expected such a big right. signal. Right. Amazing. Okay. Yeah. We're going to go quickly to the lightning round. Are we ready? All right. Rapid fire. Rapid fire. Uh, Carl West on Instagram says, would it be possible for gravitational waves to alter matter as it passes through? E.g., if matter was too close to the source, the gravitational waves could have become damaged or altered by the sheer energy or force of the waves propagating through the fabric of space-time. That's so easy to answer so fast. <laughs> gravitational waves are the most pen- penetrating things that, are, that man has ever encountered. They go through everything. Nothing's going to stop them. They go right through the Earth. Yeah. All right. Uh, do gravitational <laughs> waves cancel each other out like sound waves? No. <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, well, that's, let me be parenthetic about it. They could, but it would be taking an enormous amount of pre- precision to do that. You could have a compression while the other one is a, a, a rare fraction. So, like yeah, water. But it's, it's, it's not impossible, but my God, in the real world, it's not going to happen. Yeah. All right. Um, <laughs> if two black holes collided near us, what, uh, would the gravitational waves be strong enough to disrupt our own magnetic field? What, what could happen because of that clash? Well, if that collision happened in our solar system, we would be, we might not even be here. Uh, and, uh, I, and I'll tell you really? what happens. We would oh, get in our stretched. solar system, yeah. Yeah, uh, we, we, we would be stretched and compressed in such a way that things could easily come apart. Uh, that question, by the uh, way, was from Mike up. Schneiders on Facebook. Okay. Um, David Norio on Facebook says, why are we referring to gravity as a force since it's the result of the curvature of space-time? And what about the other forces? Are they also the result of something we can't see yet? Well, that's an interesting question, and I can't answer it because it may very well be we don't have the, the final theory, but maybe you should try We're loose way. in this language. It's true that Einstein made us realize that in some sense gravity is not a force, that we're falling freely in a curved space-time. We're not actually being touched and pulled upon. But there's another way to look at it that makes it look like a lot of the other forces. So electric fields permeate space and affect things. Gravitational fields permeate space and affect things. There's a way of making them sound more parallel. Yeah. And, and there's always force carriers, gravitational waves, light waves, weak force carriers, the gauge uh, You, on, re- you on can recast up. gravitation as yeah. Steve Weinberg did, for exactly. example, as a field theory if you want. You don't have to use Einstein's beautiful theory. Well, what people say is if Einstein hadn't discovered uh, curved space-time theory, we'd be talking about it in this much more particle physics-y yeah. sort of a way. All right. Uh, The Scarlet Speedster on Twitter says, uh, how do gravitational waves affect time slash perception of time? What would need to occur to have significant changes? Well, I don't Mm -hmm. know if I can answer that. The metric that I use does not have the clocks perturbed by the gravitational waves. Yeah, so it's like um, what, what I call left isn't what you call left. It's a mixture of your left and right. We tend to orient our space-time so that it's only the space that changes, not the time. But you could orient your space-time differently where you would measure it being in the time direction. It's not easy stuff. All right. Tony Hale on Facebook says, Do gravitational waves reflect light? And if so, could you dial in an image like flipping a page in a book? If we can't see our galaxy in the past, but the light reflected from our galaxy is traveling faster than we are... Would that mean we could see an image bounce back at us? I don't think that'll happen. But let me tell you something. There's a very nice way of thinking about gravitational waves affecting the propagation of light. You don't have to have mirrors doing it. In hmm. other words, they, they interact as to make sidebands on the light. That's a complicated way of saying it. But you, for example, some of the other ways of looking at gravitational waves do not use mirrors, like the pulsar timing. Uh, does not mm-hmm. use mirrors. So consequently, there's an interaction between gravitational waves and the propagation of light. Yeah, that is some hard stuff. I'm not even going to try to clear it up because we're at the end of our show. <laughs> oh, Thank dear. you so much for the excellent questions. It's yeah. been a great show today. Ray, always an honor well, and a you for pleasure to me. talk to you. Yeah. Matt, so great to have you on. Thank check you. out Probably Science yeah. at Matt Kirshen on your Twitter feed. Uh, thanks so much for being here with me. This has been Star Talk All Stars. Thanks for listening. See you in the multiverse. This is Star Talk.